thanks, O Lord, what is my heart like? Before the God I sing your praise. I bow down towards your holy name. It is pleasant to remain with your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have exalted me above all things. Your name is your glory. And the earth is all that you have given me. And the sun is full of my goodness. I sing praise. Thank you, Pastor Dennis. Uh, please remain standing as we um, sing some songs of praise. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness. New every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. What love, what love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sons. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Riches. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord.
Who has held? Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God, seated on His throne, come let us adore Him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore Him. Who has given? Who has given counsel to the Lord? Who can question any of his words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all his wondrous deeds? Behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore him. Who has felt? Who has felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man? God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on his throne, 
Come, let us adore Him. Behold the King. Nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. You will reign.
Thank you, Pastor Dennis. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in singing this morning. Church family, every week we have the opportunity to observe the Lord's Supper. At our church, uh, we welcome any believer who is baptized to come and partake of the cup and the bread. Communion symbolizes the new covenant that Jesus has put in place for us. Uh, the bread represents his body that was broken on the cross as he took the punishment that we deserve on himself. And his blood represents the new covenant, God's promise that whoever puts their faith in Christ is fully forgiven of their sins now until forever. So we get to celebrate that as believers this morning. So again, I invite you, if you are a baptized believer, please line up and our deacons, Victor and Richard, will pass the elements to you. Please hold on to it, go back to your seat, and we will all observe communion together. You may line up. As we partake of the bread and cup, we receive Christ and all of his benefits. We have our faith nourished. We have our minds reminded of the death that he took in our place as he was nailed in the cross for the sins of many. We receive this sacrament as a sign and seal of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 
The Apostle Paul writes this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the body together. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup together. And pray again for us. Oh, Jesus, we thank you for your death in our place. And we praise you because you rose victorious from the grave. Because you conquered not just our sin, but the sin of the world. You gave your life as a ransom for many. And so we honor you this morning because you came into the world, into your own creation, and your own did not receive you. But some did receive you. And whoever did put, your, put their faith in you, you gave them and us the right to become God's children. We thank you for the unspeakable blessing of being adopted into God's family. And now that we have one another as a church family, we give you the worship this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. I would like to take a little bit of time also to disciple you in terms of systematic theology, so I'd like to catechize you for a little bit. Catechism is a question and answer method of discipleship. I'm going to read a prompt from the New City Catechism, and I will invite all of us to read the response together. This morning, we will be looking at whatever question shows up on the screen. There it is, question 18. Will God allow our disobedience and idolatry to go unpunished? This is a question that aims to teach us about God's justice. Can a just God allow any sin to go unpunished? And the answer is no. Every sin is against the sovereignty, holiness, and goodness of God and against his righteous law. And God is righteously angry with our sins and will punish them in his just judgment, both in this life and in the life to come. We reflect this morning on God's justice and the fullness of his character. It is against even his goodness to not punish sin. So we reflect this morning on the good and just God. At this time, I want to dismiss our kids, ages 4 to 9, to go off to KFC and uh, learn the word. Uh, kids for Christ, not Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, welcome to newcomers who are not familiar with KFC. Welcome to our newlyweds as well, who are familiar with KFC. <laughs> Once I said KFC, oh, it was KFC. <laughs> it was great. Uh, let's, uh, let's stand together as we read the word of the Lord. This morning, we're looking at the Apostle Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. I'll read this for us. Paul writes this, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it, and even now you are not ready for it, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. This morning, I would like to speak to you all on the topic of spiritual maturity. Uh, very often, people are people of extremes. You have uh, Christians who lean more, you can call it sentimental. Uh, the sentimentalists will lean on this idea that to be mature, to be close to God, is to always feel very strongly, uh, to always have a very passionate sense of their relationship with God. And on the other extreme, we have what you call intellectuals, people who think that uh, to mature as a Christian is to learn a lot, to go deeper and deeper into theology, to go deeper and deeper into the Word, and as a man of extremes, I have experienced both in my life. 
So growing up in a Chinese youth group, we were influenced very strongly by our Korean friends in our Christian clubs at school. So we were all low-key charismatic as well. Uh, we brought in this idea that uh, the bulk of your youth group experience should be musical worship. It should be singing very passionately. Uh, if you don't feel God's closeness as you sing during musical worship, then something must be wrong because your faith must not be genuine. And so you have to keep on pursuing this high. And we always chase these highs. At youth retreat, you come in on the bus expecting to weep during worship. That was the goal. And so you, like, you start the first afternoon. It's all right. It's pretty chill. People are jumping around. It's great. And you wait and wait because you know the last night is when you cry. And everyone's just saving up their tears. And everyone on the last night cries. That's what it is. That was what we were raised in. And then I went off to college. And I went to the other extreme. I realized that uh, those are just feelings. And feelings don't quite mean much. It doesn't mean that you sincerely have a relationship with God or you even know him. You're just worshiping your feelings. So you have to anchor yourself completely in the word and your feelings don't matter. And all you have to do is become a eight-point Calvinist and you will finally be a real Christian. And so I poured myself into the word and I wanted to study. And everything about my faith was about what I knew and how well I could argue with other people and convince them that their theology was wrong. I want to teach you this morning about real spiritual maturity, not what I went through the first uh, 20-something years of my life. And honestly, I'm still learning this as well, and this was a really good lesson for me to learn uh, as I studied this passage this past week. I want to teach you how to pursue real spiritual maturity. This morning, we're covering this in two points. The first point is that we have to live out God's word. This comes from verses 1 through 4. We have to learn how to live out God's word. And we're going to break this point down into two neat subpoints. We have to learn first that a lack of application reveals immaturity. A lack of application reveals immaturity. It doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter how much you feel. If you are not living out the word of God, then you cannot say that you are mature or that you are close to him. Lack of application reveals immaturity. Now, this passage has a very uh, interesting phrase that's a little bit debated, uh, especially among Catholics and Protestants. There is this phrase that Paul uses in verse 1, people of the flesh. That phrase, of the flesh, is debated, and I want to unpack that for you. I want to explain how we can actually define that term from within the passage. Notice, when Paul says that he could not address them as spiritual people, he says this, I couldn't address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. And then he very quickly adds a clarifying phrase, as infants in Christ. So you see those two phrases are correlated together. They help define each other. For someone to, for a believer to still be of the flesh means that they are infants in Christ. They are immature. And as this term keeps coming up, I'll keep on building our definition. But all we have to see right now is that for a Christian to be of the flesh means that they are an immature believer. Paul does affirm that they are in Christ. Right? He says, you are infants in Christ. That means that you are actually genuinely a believer, saying nothing about how mature you are. So we can affirm that. But verse 2, he moves on. He uses a different metaphor. He talks about babies and food. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Paul switches to this metaphor, which is very effective because it's very easy to understand. Why do you feed a baby milk? Uh, Well, a fresh baby out of the womb doesn't really have teeth. They have gums. You can feed it a zucchini, but it cannot chew the zucchini, and it cannot digest the zucchini. But the baby can take milk and swallow it and digest it. The problem here is not the availability of good food, because Paul is a good teacher, and they had pastors working with them. They received teaching from Apollos, from Paul, from whoever else. They had good food, but they couldn't handle it yet. Paul says, even now, you are still infants. You are still not ready for solid food. You can put it into the baby's mouth, but it won't benefit. In the same way, brothers and sisters, you can hear good preaching, but if if you're not digesting it, if it doesn't change your life, then it won't benefit you. If If you're not digesting it, you will not benefit from it. 
This gives us a clue as to what Paul means when he's talking about spiritual infancy, spiritual maturity. Let's keep going on, verses 3 and 4. Immaturity is visible in how you live. Verse 3, you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? See, again, Paul uses two phrases. You see the phrase of the flesh, and this time he adds a different phrase that helps clarify what he means. Of the flesh, behaving only in a human way. That is to say, there's nothing spiritual about you. Paul's telling the Corinthians, look, you, you are a believer. That is true. You have the Holy Spirit. Yes, you should be a spiritual person, and you claim to be a spiritual person, but the thing is, I look at your life, and there's absolutely nothing spiritual about you. You are being led by the flesh and not by the Spirit. And he gives a case in point. He brings them back to the earlier issue that he introduced in chapter 1. They were being proud. They were being boastful. They were aligning themselves with different leaders in the capital C church. Some said, I follow Paul. Others said, I follow Apollos. And we covered this a few weeks ago. The focus is not on the leaders. The focus is on the Corinthians. The emphasis is, I follow this person, so I'm right and everyone else is wrong. Paul calls them out. Look, if there is jealousy, if there is strife, competition, bitterness, envy toward one another, if that's what characterizes your church family, then how can you possibly say that your church is spiritual? Because if you are spiritual, you are led by the Spirit. And tell me, can, can you find jealousy and strife in the fruit of the Spirit? No. Because Paul teaches in Galatians 5, if you are led by the Spirit, you can tell because the Spirit will develop these fruits in you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nowhere can you find anything remotely related to jealousy and strife. The Spirit would never lead his church to tear itself apart. The Spirit will only lead the church to build itself up in love. And that's why Paul could say, you're not spiritual. You're living just like a human, merely human. What we can see is that their knowledge hasn't transformed their lives. All the things that they learned from God's word, from the preaching that they heard, the studies that they had, all their learning affected nothing. Remember that Paul shouts that out. He says in chapter 1, verse 5, you have all knowledge. God has given it to you. God has revealed the mysteries of the gospel and doctrine to you. You have no lack of knowledge. What you have is lack of application. You're not digesting it, so you're not benefiting from it, so you are not ready for solid food. You're not ready for grown-up teaching because you haven't even digested baby teaching. So Paul says, how can you expect me to teach you heavier things when you haven't even really digested the most basic things? And more importantly, how can you expect that of yourself? A lack of application reveals immaturity. So to combat that, you and I, this morning, have to learn how to live out God's word. Because if you are not digesting whatever you receive from God's word, then you are not benefiting from it. You can sit under good teaching, you can have great Bible studies, you can learn theology. You can learn the right answers to everything. You can learn apologetics, but if it's not changing your life, then it's not benefiting you at all. It's like you're just going to wine tastings, and you're like sipping a little bit of wine, all oh, French, spit it out, and that's it. There's absolutely no benefit. You're just tasting, but you're not digesting. It's not growing you. How do we live out God's word? Let me give you a few pieces of advice. First, I want to caution you against pursuing novelty. Beware the craving for novelty. You know what happens a lot? If you've been in church roughly two years, you have heard just about everything. There's only so much to say. Because we're not going to unpack the depths of systematic theology from the pulpit. It's just not feasible. It's not possible. We're preaching for people from like age 12 to age 70-something. We, we can't explain all that in a way that the entire room can benefit from. So we preach passage by passage, and we show what the Word of God says. And what happens is you start distilling things. You start explaining things, hopefully in a way that the middle schooler can understand and the 70-something-year-old can still appreciate. And what happens is it starts sounding familiar, and you start thinking, I've heard this before, I know this concept, I've heard this word before, and then you start tuning it out, because it's not new. 
and you start craving for novelty. You keep thinking, I want new. I want something I haven't heard before. I want to be challenged intellectually because I'm a smart person. And then we start thinking, if we're not careful, if I didn't learn anything new, it was not helpful. If I didn't learn anything new, then it did not benefit me. The thing about Christian doctrine is that it is so complex and nuanced that you can distill something as complex as the love of God into those three words, four words, the love of God. You can explain that as a simple concept to a two-year-old, a three-year-old, but you can also spend years unpacking it and writing a PhD dissertation on just the love of God. The doctrine of God is so profound that it can be reduced so that anyone can understand it but you can spend the rest of your life exploring it. Uh, I want to model this by explaining to you how I listen to Pastor Dennis' sermons. Uh, Pastor Dennis and I have the same level of education. We are both MDiv. He has eight, nine more years of pastoral experience than I do. When I listen to him preach, I am not expecting to hear anything that I do not know. If I learn something new from him, it's probably heresy. (laughs) So, you... Okay, look, if you invent something new, it's probably wrong. Okay, that's, it's, it's been around for a long time. When I listen to Pastor Dennis, I look to be fed. I want him to explain the word of God, tell me what it means, give me the application so that I can receive it. After a while, look, it's not about learning new things. After a while, you come, think, think of this as you are coming into our home and the pastors are cooking for you. We want you to be fed. Pastor Dennis and I have different ways of cooking. We use different seasonings. We use different processes. We present and plate our dishes in a certain way. What, the thing is, it's not about that. It's not about how we present it. It's actually not even about the flavor. It's about the nourishment. It's about what you can gain from the word of God. I want to encourage you, don't just look for novelty. Look to be fed. Look for the pastors who preach here to explain the word of God in a way that forces you, confronts you, with application, because that's what we're trying to do. And the next thing we have to think about, aside from not just chasing after novelty, is don't confuse familiarity with mastery. Just because you're familiar with something doesn't mean that you have mastered it. For example, I am not a STEM person. My brain is not a STEM brain. I was a music major. Uh, I can multiply things by two up until 12. Uh, Sometimes I can divide by three. Uh, It's debatable. Uh, I'm not good at math. Look, I I went to a very competitive, uh, mostly Asian-American high school, very STEM-oriented, very, very, very math. And to this day, uh, I I cannot tell you at what point two trains will meet if they're traveling at this speed and that speed. I I still can't tell you. I don't know. Look, it's familiar to me. I I know what algebra looks like. (laughs) It has these little English letters and little small numbers on top. I can tell you that. I'm familiar. If you say algebraic words, I'm like, oh, yeah, algebra 2, I got that. Have I mastered it? (laughs) No. (laughs) To this day, I have not. I feel very dumb when I work with Berkeley people. (laughs) I I really do. Just let me tell you that. The thing is, just because you're familiar with something doesn't mean that you have mastered it. Let me put this to you. When we tell you something like, You can't hide your anger. You can't hide your impatience. You can't keep on building your identity on what other people think of you. And your first instinct is, I know, I know, I know. I've heard that before. I'm working on it. But what happens is, if that's your first instinct, is to shut it down completely, then you are not benefiting in that moment. We are trying to spoon feed you doctrine, and you're saying, "Mm, not today. The minute you think that just because you're familiar with it, that you've mastered it, that you don't need to hear it again, then you will not be able to grow because you are refusing to be nourished. We are trying to feed you the things that you need so that you can grow. Let me explain like this. We preach the gospel every week because you still need it. We will stop preaching the gospel when all of you and ourselves are fully sanctified. But until each of us is perfectly like Christ, we cannot stop hearing the gospel because we will never graduate from the gospel until the day that we die or until Jesus comes back. That's why we preach the way we do. So don't stop listening just because you've heard it before, please. This is for your benefit. Third, whatever you're fed, don't just leave it as it was a good reminder. See, this is what happens when people are familiar, right? They've heard it before, and they're like, oh yeah, I needed to hear that. Great reminder. And then that's it. 
<laughs> Whenever I hear the phrase good reminder, I'm like, oh, this person's not listening. <laughs> This person is not going to change this person's life. Look, I, I can preach for 45 minutes, and it will not change, for li- change your life if you just say, good reminder. Because it shuts it down. Because you're trapping it in the realm of your intellect. You're saying, this is just about what I know, and I need to be reminded that this is true. No. Preaching needs to go down into your heart, through your mind, into your heart, out into your action. If you're stopping it at the head level, it will never sink into your heart. And then much less will it come out in your life. Instead of just stopping it at good reminder, why not ask the Spirit to impress on you the full weight of God's Word? Ask the Spirit to show you exactly how you personally need to be applying God's authoritative Word. Ask the Spirit to show you specific areas of sin that you have not yet given up to God. Another easy example. Let's say the, the, it comes down to uh, anger again. Ask the Spirit specifically, show me who I'm angry with. Show me the person that I'm just used to being angry at and I've kind of dulled it at, down to a little static that barely bothers me. Make me sensitive again. Because what happens is if we receive the same stimuli over and over again, we get desensitized. And in the same way, if we get tempted the same way over and over again, and if we sin over and over again in the same way, we become desensitized. Our consciences become seared so that we can't feel it anymore. So you ask the Spirit, help me to feel it. Help me to feel the gravity of sin so that I can give it up to you, so that I can lean on you. Help me by following you. Paul says these people are walking of the flesh. They are following the influence of the flesh The flesh is just whatever inside you that pulls you away from God. It's the Spirit's job to pull you toward God. And so you ask the Spirit to lead you, to help you. See, the mature person will not be satisfied by proximity or familiarity. Just to be close to God's people, to be close to God's word, to be familiar with God's people, to be familiar with God's word. A mature person will not be satisfied with those things. A mature person will pursue real intimacy with God. And the best way to do that is to come to understand a little more fully how much you need him. The thing is, you you always need him. You always need to be relying on him. People think that they only have to approach the throne of grace for help in times of need, and they think, oh, a time of need is when I just can't do it by myself anymore. I don't have any strength left. All I have is God. Foolish. You never have any strength of your own. You have no spiritual ability of your own, but God invites you at all points, come to the throne of grace. Recognize that your time of need is not just when you feel like it. Your time of need is always because you cannot live a Christian life apart from the grace that God provides. You cannot do anything spiritual apart from the grace of God that comes through his spirit. So, please draw close to God's throne. Please ask him for grace. Experience closeness with him and real intimacy with him by always drawing near, by living at the throne of grace. And not just drawing near when you think you need it. Live at the throne of grace. Second, I want to encourage you to lean on God's grace. This comes from verses 5 through 9. Paul wants to round off this discussion. Remember, this is a three-chapter arc. He introduced it at chapter 1, verse 10. Now he's rounding it off here in this passage. And he wants to round off this discussion by developing their philosophy of ministry. Uh, What is a pastor? What is a church leader? What is our relationship as normal people to the pastors of the church? Paul wants to clarify. He wants to make it beyond the shadow of a doubt. Uh, Pastors are not for you to fangirl about. You should not have fan clubs for your pastors, whoever they are. They are God's servants. Pastors are God's servants for your sake. And I recognize that none of us are apostles in this room. Very few of us are pastors in this room. But I do think that this does apply to all of us because if you are a believer, you are called into God's service. If you are a believer, you are called into God's service. I want to break this apart into three subpoints this time. The first is grace empowers service. 
Grace empowers servants. I already kind of leaked into this from the last point. Grace empowers servants. Paul wants to lay the stress on their identity as servants. He says in verse 5, what then is Apollos? Or who is Paul? What is Paul? Servants. The English matches the Greek very well in terms of word order. The emphasis is on the first word, we are servants, through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. Why would you elevate a servant? Why would you build a fan club around Paul or Apollos? Look, these are great men, but as servants, they are called to point to their master. A servant is never meant to draw attention to himself or herself. A servant points to the master. So, if these great men serve this master, then this master must be even greater. So they are very concerned with showing Christ. And Paul makes it very clear. The Corinthians weren't even saved through him. As in, I should say, the, he did not save the Corinthians. He was not the one that ultimately brought them to faith. He was not the one that brought them through the gates of heaven into Jesus' presence forever. He says, they were servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. His focus is on God's power, his empowering grace. Paul wants to show them, look, yeah, we were the uh, face-to-face people you interacted with, but we are not the ones that saved you. It was because God assigned you to each of us so that when we delivered the gospel to you, you believed. That is distress. See, the thing is, Paul is just an instrument. Paul and Apollos were just tools that God used. They're useless apart from him. You have a really nice piano. The piano is useless apart from someone who can play it. Why would you glorify the piano? The piano's value is only seen when the player uses it. In the same way, Paul and Apollos only had any value insofar as God used them. There was no reason to boast in these people. But then Paul switches. He uses a different metaphor. Paul's a very metaphorical guy, and now he wants to talk about crops. He's using an agricultural metaphor, and he wants to use this to further explain what is the relationship between God and his servants. Verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. The way that God's kingdom works is this. God gives his servants things to do, and God has his own work that no one else can do. God gives his servants things to do, but there is work that only God can do. And in his kingdom, God's servants work harmoniously. They work together. They don't fight each other for territory. They are working side by side. Every single servant's work is necessary. In God's kingdom economy, it's not a question of ability. Uh, I think sometimes uh, in, in an effort to combat the possibility of pride in ministry, right? Because like, if you're in a public role like me or like on the worship team or whatever, Uh, It's very easy to make things about yourself. And so a very common fix is to say something like, oh, you're, 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 you're replaceable. Just remember that you're replaceable. God doesn't need you for his kingdom. And on one level, that is true. It is true that every single one of us is replaceable. But what that misses is something very special about how God calls his servants, not just us on stage, but all of us in this room. It's not a question of ability. It's not a question of replaceability. It's the fact that God has given you work that only you can do. Because only you are you. Because only you have the relationships that you have. Only you are going to the work that you have. Only you have the classes and the labs and discussions and the clubs that you have. Only you have the family that you have. So on the one hand, yes, We are all replaceable because there will always be God's people who are preaching the gospel. Yes. On the other hand, no. You are not replaceable because God raised you up for the people in your life and no one else can do your job for you. Every servant's work is unique and necessary. But every servant's work is nothing apart from God's empowering grace. So that's why Paul says, look, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. All that you and I can do in Paul's pattern is to set people up to grow. We cannot bring the dead to life. Look, that is God's prerogative, okay? We cannot bring the dead to life, and that is the most important part of Christian ministry. 
It is not just being nice to people. It is not just having people think, wow, Christians are like reasonable people after all, and they're not all screamy and stuff. That's not the goal. The goal is to bring the dead to life through the preaching of the gospel, and we have to come to terms with the fact that you and I do not have that power. And even less, we can't even make people grow. All we can do is put people in the best possible conditions for life and for growth. We can only set people up to succeed. We cannot grow them. That is God's prerogative. So when it comes to leaning on God's grace, what I mean is that, look, if you don't, you're not going to be able to do anything. If you don't lean on God's grace, there will be no power to your service. There will be no impact. There will be no fruit. Second, grace humbles the servant. And we're building, we're building, we're building. Verse 7. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. I want to help us conceive of ourselves a little bit. What does it mean to be a servant? Uh, Two things. First, we are nothing. The servant is nothing. Look at what Paul says. Look, as great as he is, Apollos and him, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. In plain English, we are nothing. No matter how much effort we put in, no matter how much we're pouring out of ourselves, we are nothing. Look, organizationally, we can grow. Numerically, we can grow. We can make an impact on the community around us. We can participate in community service. That is all good things. We can grow in our programming. Our music can get better and better. One day our sound system will work, actually. It's going to be amazing. We can keep growing in those ways, but the thing is, that is not gospel ministry. We are nothing. Everything that we do is nothing because without God, we can do nothing. We just play church. Look, servants come and go, but God grows his church. Servants are nothing. But at the same time, we are critical. We are critical because God has chosen to do his saving work through us. God has chosen to do his saving work through us. See, the interesting balance in God's kingdom is that we are not able to bring people to life and we are not able to help people grow. But for some reason, God in his wisdom decides that he is going to use people like us to accomplish those exact things. Even though you and I do not have the power to raise someone up from from the dead to life and the power to make someone grow, we don't have that power, but God is going to do those things through us. God is going to use your efforts to bring the gospel to your non-believing friend. God is going to use your efforts to disciple a young believer. That is God's kingdom. And it is an immense privilege to be able to participate in that. And in verse 8, Paul tells us that God also rewards us for doing what we are supposed to do. He rewards us for doing what we are supposed to do. I am not going to touch on this because this is Pastor Dennis's passage for next week, so you can wait on that. The last thing I want to lean on in uh, unpacking this is verse 9. Uh, the English is a little misleading. The English ESV says, uh, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. Uh, the way it reads in English is it puts the emphasis on we versus you. We are God's fellow workers. You are are God's field, God's building. That's actually not a good translation. The emphasis on the Greek is actually on God. Each phrase starts with, of God, fellow workers, of God, field, of God, building. That's how it sounds in Greek, but in English. The emphasis is not on the distinction between the pastors and the church. The emphasis is on the fact that no matter who we are, no matter what roles we have, we all belong to God. And that is Paul sealing the deal. There is no reason that the Corinthians should make celebrities out of any leader or servant in the church. Because at the end of the day, we all belong to God. Because we were all bought by the same blood. Because nothing made Paul good apart from Christ. Paul was bad apart from Christ. Paul was persecuting the church, throwing Christians in jail, having people executed because of Christ. But when Jesus revealed himself to Paul, when Jesus showed Paul that he needed Christ just as much as anyone else, that Paul was the first and foremost of sinners, that he needed God's forgiveness. And when Paul put his faith in Christ, that is what changed him. That is what gave him real value. And the thing is, Paul is just like every other Corinthian. 
And Pastor Dennis and I are just like you in the sense that we are not here because we are better. We are here redeemed just like every single one of you believers is. We were all bought by that same blood and we all owe our lives to that same resurrected Savior. The gospel is a leveling thing. There's no room for boasting. There's no room for celebrities. There's no room for distinctions. So having said all of that, lean on God's grace. Lean on God's grace. Look, the church is in roughly its 2,000th year-ish. Servants come and go. The apostles are all dead. First wave of church fathers, all dead. Second wave, dead, dead, dead. They're all dead. John Calvin's dead. Luther's dead. Arminius is dead. Jonathan Edwards is dead. They're all dead. Servants come and go. But it's the same God through the generations. It's the same God working to save people throughout the nations, throughout the generations. And every generation, God wants to raise up faithful servants. So the question for you this morning is, will you answer that call? Will you live as one of God's servants? Because that is what you have been redeemed to do. Let me put it like this. Will you work for his glory? Will you study for his glory? Will you be a friend for his glory? Will you raise families for his glory? I think a lot of times we get caught up with like, uh, yeah, that's so abstract. What does it mean to do these things for his glory? I just have to study. So how do I study for his glory? Do I study while listening to Christian music? Is that how you do it? Look, don't get caught up with the specifics of that. Because if you haven't even gotten the heart posture down, there's no reason to start thinking about other things. Start with the heart posture. Start with the commitment that you are going to glorify God some way, somehow, in everything that you do, in your work, in your studies, in your families, everything. Start with that, because that's the beginning of leaning on God's grace. That is the beginning of answering his call to serve him. And as you serve him, as you walk by his spirit, as the spirit changes your life, then you will grow in faith. Then you will become more and more mature as a believer. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the calling to serve you. God, it's a privilege to not only be redeemed by you, but also called into your service. And so we ask for those of us in this room who are believers that you would help us to serve you well, to pursue real maturity. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Theo, for the sermon. Um, if you can all stand as we sing a song in response. gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold Show. 
Let's all stand together. Now receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen. You're dismissed. I love you. Have a great week.